of, thank you, past international president and distinguished Toastmaster. Pat is a resident of Ontario, Canada, and has been a member of Toastmasters since 1983. She was the fifth woman to serve as international president of Toastmasters International and is currently serving as a region advisor. Pat is an ontological life coach and consultant in her own company, Pat Johnson and Associates, where she coaches groups and individuals who aspire to achieve more both personally and professionally. Pat is the author of the Handbook for Building and Sustaining Vibrant Toastmasters Programs in Corporations. Please help me welcome Pat Johnson to our District 95 Corporate Leadership Training. Thank you so much, Kushi and Katerina, and thank you, District 95 members, for showing up for a topic that I, like Kushi, is very important to me. I have a great love of corporate clubs. I, I learned about corporate clubs very early in my Toastmastering career. I was just uh, six years a member and the very first club that I helped charter was in an IT company in a, in a city that was about 300 miles away from where I lived. But I got a taste. Uh, so that the first club I chartered uh, was corporate. And since then, I've been very interested in what makes corporate clubs successful or corporate programs successful and how do we set them up to make sure that they succeed. Uh, I come to this content from a learning and development background. My professional career has been, uh, prior to having my own company as a coach, was running learning and development departments in corporations. And so I decided what the needs, well, we did needs assessments within our corporation, and then I hired people to actually do the training that met the, the needs of our people. And in that process, looked at, at programs and analyzed them, what works, what doesn't work. Will this give us the results that we're looking for? What are the obstacles to this being a good program? And I found myself asking out loud, why don't more corporations have Toastmasters as part of their training department? And my sad response was that Toastmas Toastmasters in the past have never asked us to do that. So as a result, we didn't know that we could do it. And so I set out to look at the difficulties or the challenges that Toastmasters was experiencing being in the workplace and making them actually highly successful. And so today I'm going to share with you some of my findings, and I certainly invite you to ask questions as I go through uh, my experience and things that I've written about and certainly continue to talk about uh, on a weekly basis. I was just sharing with Kushi and Katerina that just yesterday I had an opportunity to uh, sit in and lead a call with a corporation here in Canada that was looking at building a Toastmasters Club and talk to them about what they needed to do to make it successful and how to partner with Toastmasters International. So I'm going to cover a few areas. Uh, the first area I'm going to cover, and I'll just give you a brief outline. I'm going to talk about the mindset. So uh, Oralee, I heard you talking about your working to just get a club started. And so I, I'll talk a bit about the mindset that we need when we're talking to corporations and that we also need to have if we've been a member of a community club or we're transitioning to a corporate uh, program. I'm going to talk about some basic qualifications that Toastmasters requires for any Toastmaster club and suggestions in terms of us uh, informing the corporation. Uh, I'm going to talk, I'll spend some time talking about the language and how I change the language when we're in the corporate world so that we sound like the corporation and we use the titles and words that they relate to and the transferable skills as well. Another area that I will touch on is talking about the 
principles of the Toastmasters training program that are different than other training that happens in the corporate world, which really creates some confusion and, and um, even perplexity because they look at it and they go, this doesn't look like training. What do you mean people don't graduate? What do you mean there's no pass or fail? And so we'll look at some of those items and then uh, looking at the expectations for that partnership between Toastmasters and the corporation in order to make it happen. And, and then we'll also look at those um, transferable skills as well as those requirements that we have from the HR or the, or the training departments in the corporation, as well as what we bring to the table. So a lot to cover. But um, I invite you to ask questions as we go along and I'll, I'll break it into categories. So I wanted to start out by talking about the mindset before we begin. Uh, when, we, when we start in any project, it's really important to have a real clear map and have all our principles aligned before we get started. Because what I know is that it's really important to begin as you intend to continue. So you want to start things out the way it's going to be going forward. That's, that's important because people, we teach people what to expect from us and how to treat us. And people are watching at the beginning to see what they need. Uh, how are we interacting with one another? So be very clear before you get started talking to anyone, what you need from them, what you're willing to bring to the partnership so that you have it figured out. Uh, you want to sound just like you know what you're doing and that you know what's needed. So, so do lots of preparation ahead of time. You want to deal with the corporation, whoever is in charge, uh, whether that's an HR department, whether that's a VP or a CEO, it might be the training department. Where are you starting to talk to? And you don't want to necessarily, and uh, this is not something that I would do, I would not want to talk to an employee uh, singularly that says, oh, I want to take Toastmasters into my corporation. My response to that individual would be, okay, set up a meeting with HR or your training department and I'll come in with you. So I want to go to the decision maker, the person or the group that's going to actually get involved with us in this program. One person is not going to be able to do it unless they're in that department. So you want to make sure that you're dealing with the corporation, not an individual. If you are um, supporting the club, I think it's really important as closely as we can to reflect the corporation. So for example, I've been into many corporations that are really young, vibrant. There's, they're full of 20, 25 year olds. And I go, I'm not the person that should have been sent in there because they don't relate to me. They're going to say, oh, you're my mother. Oh, you're my grandmother. And so it's really important that we have a connection and, and age doesn't always determine attitude, but you want to have a connection. Uh, give some thought to if they're a, a super casual uh, organization, does your tone match them? Can you work with them and build that? Because it's those subtleties that are important as well. One of the Oh, I don't know what the phrase is. One, I'll just say things that's not very descriptive, but one of the things that I've noticed, so when people go in to talk about the Toastmasters program to someone else, and they're actually hoping to establish a Toastmasters program or club, is that they make apologies, or they have difficulty talking about how much it costs, or how much time it takes. I feel that it's absolutely critical that if you're doing the enrollment or the sales of this idea, that you get clean 
um, energetically around this. I hope you understand that word. But if you got hangups about money and you have difficulty asking people for money, don't be the person that's going in to ask for the money. Have somebody like me that says, ah, it'll be whatever it's going to be. I'm not afraid to ask for money because within me, I know the value and the life-changing value of the Toastmasters program. So these are all things to keep in mind before you even go in. You want to make sure that you can explain the program and the value of it. And you're just totally not um, energetically connected to the money. It's just a vehicle for them to access the material. Really important attitude also when you're meeting with the corporation is that you want to establish a partnership with them. You want to find out what they already have in place, how they recruit members for their training, how they enroll people in their any training programs they have, how do they track their training, because we don't have to do this. We're not in the business of doing this. Toastmasters is not going to do this for the corporation when we partner with them. They're going to do it if we set it up as a partnership. So we want to find out how we're going to partner. One of the first questions that I ask any corporation is, are you paying for your members' tuition? Are you giving them time during work hours to attend the training? And the other question I ask is, how do, you pay, how do they get other training in your corporation? So for example, if they're going to project management or conflict resolution or soft skills training, do you pay for that? And do you send them during work hours? Great, then Toastmasters would be the same. So I'm always aiming to put it in the calendar during the work days and that the tuition is paid by the organization, particularly if they're doing it for other training. Now, a lot of corporations will share the responsibility with, with their employees and they'll say, you can either take the time or take the tuition, but you have to bring one or the other to the partnership. And that's okay too. So, but we have to find out how they run their training so we can figure out uh, how the Toastmaster curriculum will fit into their environment. One of the things that we've learned is not to uh, ever apologize uh, for the time that it'll take. Like I ask employers to hold Toastmaster meetings for one hour every week. I'm flat on that because I'm convinced that in order to practice and build a skill that is about experiential learning that we learn by doing, the value of our program is that people practice all the time. And if you're practicing our meeting once a month or every two weeks, and you've got 30 people in your group, how many minutes every two weeks is somebody getting if they get to speak, either as an evaluator or table topics, they might get two minutes every two weeks. That's not a lot of time to practice a skill. So I'm very um, emphatic about weekly meetings when it's in corporations because of the building skills part of it, because they're also going to measure our results and the program needs uh, program time to actually produce results. When I meet with corporations, I really keep my, my personal stories out of it. Uh, I found this when I was going out with different club growth directors years ago and going to corporations is that they all wanted to tell the corporation how Toastmasters changed their life, how they met their best friends, that this is their community, their tribe. And honestly, the corporation doesn't care. They care about the transferable skills. They care about the bottom line and training their employees. So really make sure. And I think this, that the, those stories are very relevant when you're working in a community to build a community club because that's what people relate to. But not in the CEO's office or in the HR department. They want to know what's the bottom line. 
because they're all reporting to someone else and having to repeat it. So be clear on that. And then handle objections. If they've got objections or they've got questions, don't feel that those are threatening. Just know that they're coming from a place of curiosity and they're probably bringing questions not only from their own need, but other people's as well. So don't see it as a pushback, but see it as an opportunity to further explain and also to understand them because they'll tell you uh, a lot about them as you uh, deal with those objections. Yes, Simon. Thanks for raising your hand. I would like to come back on the results part. How do you think that one can present results to the management so that I can understand that Toastmasters is giving more skills or is expanding the skills of, of the employees? So how do you think, which kind of KPIs can we show? Yeah, it's, um, it's not a simple process because we build skills. But I, what I do is talk to them about all the transferable skills that we're going to build. And then I actually, uh, within the first year or two, I actually um, report out to them in terms of attendance and the projects that people are working on. So I give them hard data and, and report that out to them. And I actually ask them how often they want report status reports. And I get the, the executive members of that program or club to gather them and send them to the corporation. Yeah. And then I also, at the very initial meetings, I ask them what success looks like for them. And I then I dig around in that and see if there's anything that we can give them. The reality is that often it'll be anecdotal. Uh, it'll be observed change of behavior in the workplace, which is, yeah, it's KPIs are, are challenging. But I think also that over the long time, uh, long term, we find people are more successful in interviews because of the skills they've built. They show up differently in their team meetings or representing their organization, their confidence. How do you report confidence other than having Simon walk into the room like, Hmm, I've got it. I've got this. I'm, I'm good. I'm prepared. I knew how to prepare. And so I think that they start to see the results when we always refer them back to those transferable skills, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. So hopefully that helps, but uh, ask them what they need and what success looks like. And then that'll give you a place to look. Yes, Orly. Yes, as, as I told you, I'm working with Simon. Uh, and in my job, I'm a little bit aware of some projects and objectives uh, our head of leadership university has got from our top management. Uh, one of the difficulties we have is that they are developing their own solutions. So when we, when we are discussing with them and they ask uh, this kind of KPIs, how we are successful, my fear is that they want to be able to compare uh, at the moment, I'm just wondering how we can uh, make that obvious. It's yeah. really not it, it It's difficult to compare. And one of the things that, do you understand the um, terminology comparing apples with oranges? <laughs> Does that, so if we compare two different things, it's really difficult to find the alignment or say one is better than the other. They're just different. The um, what I talk to corporations uh, about in that situation is that what is really sets Toastmasters apart is that we build skills, that we're a place where people come to practice rather than sitting in a classroom and getting head knowledge. So I talk about uh, knowledge, skills and abilities. So we have um, we have knowledge, which is in our head, which we often get if we sit in a two-day course, they push material at us and we get knowledge. We get a binder, we file it in our computer or on the shelf, whatever it is, if it's um, physical or, or virtual. And, and that's often the end of it. There's no application. 
What sets Toastmasters apart is that we actually practice every week. We come together in our practice laboratory and we practice together building the skill. So nobody can sit back in the class and say, I'm just getting knowledge. You've got to practice it and then you build experience and you build a skill because you've got experience. That takes more time, but it long-term changes behavior and your skill level. So you can sit, for example, in a room and have a conversation about what confidence looks like and how you would demonstrate confidence, which would be a good example. On the other hand, you could build confidence. And I think that it would look different. Somebody who's had successes, got good feedback, is feeling good about themselves and shows up confidently versus I know what confidence looks like. I hope I'm making it. So I would really focus on the, uh, the thing that makes Toastmasters difference, it, different is it's experiential. It's ongoing practice every week. And over time, we build the skills, which is very unusual for organizations to do. Does that help? <laughs> it, it's hard to compare when they want to look at um, a deliverable, but there's no, but when, if they in fact went and followed up from training that took place and saw whether it was applied and changed behavior versus looking at with the Toastmasters program and the changed behavior, that would be over time, that would be the test. That's what, that's what I've found in terms of talking to corporations that helps them understand that this is longer term, yeah. Uh, Simon? I don't wanna stop you. If you still have something, I can ask you another question. Sure. So the, the question is regarding the membership piece. If the company decides to take that over, it could be that uh, it could scale crazily. I mean, if you're talking about a big corporation with a lot of employees, so that can get out of proportion maybe for the for the company. And second thing is, how do you then prevent abuse that some, some uh, members will, they will not care because they know that the company pays for their membership. So they just don't come or they are not taking that seriously. So how do you tackle that? So the two, two part of the question. The first question is, how do you, kind of limit the, the scale of it so that it, the company doesn't freak out uh, looking at the bill. And the second thing, how do you prevent abuse? Well, this thank you for that. those two questions. The first one, and I'll talk about this more in detail, but the first question as uh, answer for, from my perspective is that I ask them how many people they want in the program. So they're determining how many people they're bringing into the program because we're not flying the doors open and letting everybody rush in. We're saying to them, how many people do you wanna put in this training? So this is the partnership with them. So they're sending the people, we're not bringing them in, we're not, uh, they determine what they're willing to spend on it. We tell them how much it costs per person, they've got a budget and also what is manageable from our perspective when we go in, how long do they want are they allowing people to stay within the program? Because some organizations say, well, we'll support our employees for two years. And after that, they can pay their own tuition. Um, we'll pay for two years. So there's some uh, things that go on there uh, for them. Uh, in terms of people taking advantage, this is, again is another partnership um, relationship with the organization. And this is about how do they track their other training and how do they track attendance to training and how do they actually hold people accountable within their organization? Because they all have programs already that do this. They already have the systems. All we want to do is put Toastmasters in the system that already exists. So some, some organizations have report cards, some organizations have performance review plans, some organizations have annual reviews. 
Uh, so each employee meets with their supervisors. That's where we hold people accountable. They hold their people accountable for attending the program that they're paying them to go to. So we leave that to them, but we tell them that they're doing that and we'll provide the data. We'll provide the attendance, how many prepared speeches uh, Kushi did, how many, um, how many um, roles that uh, Katharina held during the meetings that she went to and an attendance requirement. So I asked my employees when I was in the corporate world, I asked my employees to attend a minimum of 80% of all Toastmaster meetings and they were held for that. Now, that also was an agreement with me as the supervisor that I would make sure that they were free to go, that I wouldn't say, oh, I've got an all important meeting that you have to go to because I already had an agreement with them that they went to Toastmasters during that time. So we, we give it over to them. So this is, if you've been involved with a club that hasn't been set up this way, there's a lot of paradigm shifts that we're talking about. We're talking about us, the Toastmasters not driving the bus. We're putting, we're bringing the curriculum, we're bringing pathways in on, an, on a platform online and we're going to guide their setup and support them in getting it set up internally to them in their corporation. And they're going to hold that accountable and measure that, how they measure everything else in their environment. We need to find that out and support the, their processes. Yeah, thanks, Simon. Or Lee, we'll do this one and then I'll move on because some of this is going to be talked about later. Yeah. Uh, you're muted. Or at least, sorry. I don't know if I can uh, add a few comments on that. We are quite uh, with time on asking a lot of questions based on the experience. Um, but uh, some questions we had to give you examples of some reaction. And I'm a little bit involved in the process uh, of uh, training catalog in, in Airbus, etc. So I know a little bit how it works. But we had some questions, for example, uh, what is the difference between a guest and a member? And if they can uh, send a lot of guests and minimize the number of members per club. This is one question we, we had, for example. And another question we had, or another remark we had, which I was a little bit disturbed by that, is that it was a com it was, there was a comparison with a gym club, which is for me was a clear indicator that they didn't understand that it was a, a training solution we were offering. Yeah, yeah this is often uh, a result of us not asking time during the work hours and they think it's an extracurricular activity. And I'm saying, no, this is training. This is mainstream training to be inserted into your training calendar through your training department. And so this is, this is skills training to build people's careers and 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 uh, skills. So I, I'm pretty um, adamant about that. And I go back and uh, back and back to that over and over again. And I I do not um, I do not propose in a corporation that they allow guests versus members. They're already paying for people to participate in our program. And guests, if they come, they're just taking all the precious practice time away from the people who've already made a commitment. If the corporation is recruiting people and sending people to that training, they've got advertisements out like they have for every other program in their organization. They've got wait lists for training programs, and they uh, can let those people in when, when they have an intake period. So I don't suggest that people can join whenever they want. I would suggest in a corporation that they have an intake period. So you might say, given that we have six months renewal, we might every six months, if they've lost five members, that they could bring five up to eight new members, members, not guests, members into the club from the wait list that they have. So just as they would not, you know, Orally, where I would go is that I would say, um, is that how you run? So what would be another program that 
Airbus might run. So they might hold safety training, right? Would Airbus hold safety? Okay, so they're holding a, a training for, for safety. Well, people would register for that so that they get certification for that and they get uh, acknowledgement for that and part of their job. They wouldn't let guests walk in and just participate. That's how I would compare Toastmasters. We're talking about communication and leadership skills. No guests can't walk in and take the time of those people that are signed that are looking for designations and qualifications to improve their careers with Airbus. No. They need to register for the program, sign up, and wait to take the safety qualifications, the leadership and training program, communication program that's going to help them. It, it's run the same. As soon as we make exceptions from how they run their mainstream training, then they're pushing it off and going, oh, that's, that's like having a, um, a, a tea party, or that's going for coffee together, or that's uh, a gym membership. No. No, it's not. It's actually training. The only thing Toastmasters is, is an education organization. That's all we do. That's all we've got. Now, we have a whole bunch of structure around that because we allow clubs in the communities to create their own culture. But all Toastmasters really has is their curriculum. And we're bringing the curriculum into the organization to run just as they would run their safety training. So maybe that'll help uh, with that discussion. Yeah. Okay, great. So looking at a couple of the basic qualifications that I talked to the corporation about uh, in terms of establishing uh, Toastmasters in their place, because... Um, I want to, I'm always thinking about how do we set them up for success? And so I tell a corporation that they need to have 25 to 35 people at all times in this program. And that's their responsibility to make sure the club is, that that program is filled. So if I went into a corporation as a consultant to do some training, they would say to me, how many people do you need in your class? Right? That's a very common question because some people, some classes can take 60 people, some classes can take 10. So they'll ask and you say, I need 16 people. Uh, so I, as a consultant, would say, I need a minimum of 16 people. In Toastmasters, we would say, I need a minimum of 25 to 35 people in that class at all times. If they cannot fill that class, they let me know that I'm not delivering the program. So we, as an organization, say, I'm sorry, you don't meet the minimum requirements. We need 25 to 35 people because we're always aiming to have a minimum, a minimum of 20 people at all meetings. And so we know that people are on vacation, people are ill, people... Um, for some reason, cannot attend. So we want 20 members at all times. So we have a rich learning environment. So I, I ask them for 25 to 35 people. Airbus is a huge organization, for example. 25 or 35 people out of Airbus? That's easy. If you make them do it, not you. They find the people. And I will no need for Toastmasters then that they don't see the need. They haven't recognized the need. So that's how I, how I look at that. So I'll just finish the basic requirements that I talked to them about. That there, it's an absolute requirement from Toastmasters International that the, that the program or the club meets a minimum of 12 times a year. That's a, a requirement that they sign in their contract with us. But I talk to them about they must meet. And I say that I strongly suggest they meet weekly. If we talk about this 
at the very beginning, they don't usually um, push back on that because we talk about practice. Having 25 people in a room or 20 people in a room for 60 minutes a week, three minutes a piece, not a lot of time to practice. So they get it. There's a, a minimum requirement. Um, Adam, can I have you um, see if I can mute him? Can somebody mute Adam, please? Whoever's the host, thank you. Great. So there's a minimum requirement that we do project speeches. So people that go, oh, I don't do pathways. Well, you're not in Toastmasters if you're not doing pathways, because that's our curriculum. Doing, do you, doing table topics in the club is not being in Toastmasters. Doing pathways, participating in the education program, that's where we stretch and grow. That's where we get pushed out and pulled out of our comfort zone when we get into the curriculum. So you must, if you're going to be in the integrity, you must be in pathways and doing the path work. And so we must make sure that the, the corporation is working in our curriculum because that's what we're selling them. We're selling them the curriculum where people do their assessment when they pick paths and they work through those paths. That's where the learning happens. And, and then it, we're also required in Toastmasters to give oral evaluations. That's another requirement of having a Toastmaster program. So giving evaluations is not optional. We have to give oral evaluations. There has to be someone that stands up and gives that vocal evaluation at every meeting. So think when, the, when it is that you, we don't have meetings where there's no um, project speeches because it says we have to have project speeches and oral evaluations at every meeting. So these clubs that meet and do table topics and don't do presentations are out of integrity with the program. So again, we have to begin and plant the seeds that we want to grow. So really important to, to um, do that. And then uh, we want to also plant the seeds that when there's people in their um, present, when in their organization that decide to take on those leadership roles within the program so that they're the, uh, what we would call the president or the chief liaison, that they are going to be attending leadership training that is outside the parameters of their workplace. Just as you're here tonight, outside of your workplace, they will be attending as leaders training outside of their workplace. It's expected of people that are in leadership. Leaders are always going to school and training outside of the workplace. How many people have gone to school at night or on their vacation to get extra certification? So you get the next promotion because there's no time during the work day. I got, I got my certifications and my qualifications by going, uh, because I had a child in, in university, I went on my holidays I'd take to go to school. I'd go nights, I'd go weekends to school to get my qualifications because because I wanted and needed it to keep progressing. So we pay the price. And some of that is time when we are uh, leaders, if we're actually leading in our own lives. Also, uh, talking about club officer training, Toastmaster leader institutes, all those types of activities that people will be required to attend because they have a responsibility. And then to explain to them that they belong to that global organization, that explain to them the structure of area, division, district, region, international, because there'll be people that'll come into that global organization at the corporation, for example, at Airbus, that may someday aspire to be the world champion of public speaking if they actually know it exists. Maybe there'll be somebody who desires to be the chair of an international board and they discover that they could actually do that in Toastmasters. So, but we have to tell them that they belong to this huge organization that gives them all this opportunity. If we just talk about the club that they belong to, it's pretty limiting. 
I don't know about you, but I would have been bored just inside my club after about the first five years or even before that. I would have been, ah, this is same old, same old. What's next? What's new? And, you know, fortunately for me, somebody came along and said, I want you to be an area director. And I said, sure, what's that? Sounds interesting. So I signed up and then that was it. I haven't stopped. So let your people know just because they work in a corporation doesn't mean that they don't aspire. I worked in a corporation and I aspired to do something bigger. And so it's available to us in Toastmasters. So let's talk about language. When we talk to the corporation, one of the things that I love to do, because again, because I worked in the corporation, I saw the disconnect between Toastmasters language. And so what I, what I do is talk about tuition when they're paying tuition, because that's often what we do when we go to schools, we pay tuition. I talk about the curriculum and the learning objectives in that curriculum. I don't talk about pathways. Pathways means nothing to them. They talk about the term that they would understand, curriculum or the, or the learning outlines. Talk about leadership training rather than club officers because uh, that sounds really boring and it's non-relatable. And so to talk about leadership training. Evaluations that happen in Toastmasters, I often refer to that as feedback in the corporate world because Again, it's a transferable skill. This goes directly to being a supervisor, a manager, a VP, um, anybody that's working with other people, learning to give feedback. So transferable. Talk about the meetings. I don't talk to the corporation about having meetings because I don't know about your corporations, but mine, we already had enough meetings. And who was going to sign up for another meeting and pay money to go? Oh, my goodness. So I talk about learning sessions or um, practice sessions or Toastmaster sessions. And so I, I avoid the meeting word. I talk about the I, I change the language from the vice president of education and the VP of membership, if you have those terminologies. I talk to them, I talk to those about being the leaders within the program and I have different, I talk, have them be liaisons of different things. So I have the, the chief liaison would be the president. I have the liaison, liaison of education, which would be the VP of education who's really organizing things. Uh, the, the membership liaison, who's the person that works with HR or training to make sure that the members are coming in. Uh, and down down the list. So um, I change those titles so that they don't sound like the corporate titles because they've got VPs in corporations already. And so I, I'm, I'm sensitive to that. So I, I, and, and I think liaison really um, explains the functionality. I want the liaisons to be going between the program, the Toastmasters program and the corporation, building those bridges all the time between. And I, again, I don't often refer to them as members, but participants. So again, just a, a slight different wording based on what the words are that your corporation uses. But often they don't call, oh, that's a member of safety training. They say, oh, that's a participant in safety training. So again, I don't want it to sound like we're belonging to the gym club or the chess club or whatever, but we're going to a net training program. So all that helps the mindset. So I'm going to just cover uh, quickly and, and thank you, Katarina. I'm going to just cover some um, basic principles to share with the corporation in starting and maintaining that. And then I think we're going to take a 10 minute break, right, Katarina? Okay, great. Okay, so a, uh, some principles that I want to share because this these are different and unusual for corporations when we're talking about training. And this is back to some of what we were talking about um, earlier in terms of questions. We need to explain to them that Toastmasters is a self-paced program, that it's going to go as 
fast as Pat wants for Pat. And it's going to go as slowly as Olga wants it or needs it to go for Olga. And the same for Harold, et cetera. Everybody's going to go at their own pace, although they're going to be encouraged to keep pace <laughs> and actually move but you're going to be able to set your own pace. That's important because we all start in different places. So I started as absolute terrified to speak. My big challenge when I joined Toastmasters was actually walking into a room where there were people. Never mind talking or never mind giving feedback, but just being around people was what scared me. So I was way slower than other people getting started. And that's what we need to do is remember what we were like when we started and know that the people are going to go at their own pace while we're going to encourage them to have some pace as well. We need to talk about the experiential learning, which we've talked about already. We're going to talk to them about that. Uh, our Toastmasters curriculum was built on education, adult education principles. So this was designed by adult educators and it was built on the principles of adult education. So it's experiential, it's self-paced, it's based, people can bring their own knowledge and what they've got to it. There's lots of recognition in it, um, that there's, it's participatory. And, and that there's over 300 competencies within the Toastmaster program, which some training departments are very interested in knowing about. So th over 300 competencies. We work in a team environment and we learn in a team environment. Again, this is very foreign in, um, often to corporate training. We think of sitting there and on our own going through stuff, listening to a lecturer or a teacher and, and then leaving. But in here, we participate in a team environment. We need to assure them that the course materials are provided, which we do, and that the, there's learning objectives in each of the projects. So they want to know that, that the evaluation criteria is specified so that we're going to get, teach people how to evaluate in different ways because there's different criteria. We need to assure them that there's local and international support available for the program. So as Simon and Aurelie are working with Airbus to know that the district's there to support, there's people like Pat to support, there's people within your district to support, within your region that will support and uh, ongoing. That this is an ongoing uh, learning program that Toastmasters has been around for 99 years. 99 years, and that we're in 149 countries of the world. We've had millions of people in this program. I share with them that there's no pass or fail in Toastmasters, and there's no graduation. Because I've had supervisors come to me and say, Jan's been in Toastmasters for two years. When's she going to graduate? And I'll say, whenever you either say, Jan, you can't have time from work to go anymore, or Jan says, I've had enough. But I said, she could be like me and stay for a long, long time. As long as she's learning, is there benefit in being there? But they need to know this up front because they wait for the end to come around and they depend on us to tell them, uh, there is no natural ending of this you have an agreement perhaps in your organization of how that will. So there's no pass or fail and there's no graduation. And so those are some of the things that I talk to the corporations about to set that foundation. So we're gonna take a 10 minute break as we've agreed uh, with the team to give you time to get up, move, refresh your air or water or whatever you want to do. And we'll see you back in 10 minutes and we'll continue. Thanks so much. Wow, I hope everybody had a nice break. <laughs> I got totally sucked into my email. So. <laughs>
<laughs> I was going to get up and move, but maybe after. <laughs> uh, but they say so little time and so many email. Yeah, so I wanted to talk about uh, transferable skills now. And this is one of the areas that I really uh, spend time talking to corporations. And whenever I start talking about transferable skills, I find that they get their pen out and start writing things down because this is, this is the application. And this is often where they're going to look for changes in people and what's transpiring in the room. So first of all, because Toastmasters is communication and leadership, I look at communication as listening skills, thinking skills, um, asking good questions, and then speaking skills. So uh, very important parts of that to, to break down communication. So uh, the critical listening skills for a moment are I found that listening skills were something that I couldn't find training for when I ran training departments. And yet I felt that people were very poor listeners. They didn't process information. They didn't listen carefully. They couldn't listen critically. And we actually teach that. People sort through stuff. They'll find the main point. They'll listen for the opening, the body, the conclusion. What was the purpose? Like we train people to listen very carefully. We hear grammatical errors. We hear those filler words, those audible pauses, all of those things that train us to be good listeners over time. Uh, almost impossible to buy, but we can buy it in Toastmasters, that training. Accountability is one of those skills that we train in, in it. Think of when you're the Toastmaster of the meeting or the chair of the meeting and you're gathering everybody together and you're scheduling, or we ask people to go on our whatever tool you use to schedule and people go on and actually schedule themselves. And then they show up because they're required to, or they've said to the team, they'll do it. That's teaching accountability. So that's a really important skill that goes into the workplace and life in general. We do a lot of management skills, like we do a lot of administration, we do paperwork, we do timelines, deadlines, et cetera. I don't spend a lot of time on that, but definitely uh, we track performance and uh, so, and we build plans. So I talk about teamwork the teamwork in terms of working together that out of our group comes a, a group of leaders that chair us and bring us together the things that we do we succeed and we fail together in in this program because while we build our separate skills we have a program that we run and we're working towards those measurable our own clubs kpis which are uh, designated in the uh, district or the successful club plan. Uh, critical thinking, thinking skills. We train um, thinking skills because of our attached to our listening skills, but we can become analytical, better analysis and our thinking skills and that we hear things and we're curious about them. So we have I listen to a lot of speeches, we listen to a lot of evaluations, and we give feedback on those. And so in order to do that, we have to critically think, listen critically, and, uh, and think critically to go, oh, well, here's how it could improve. So we're basically holding a standard here and measuring this behavior against that standard, which creates that critical thinking. We build presentation skills. So both formal presentation skills, which I like to think of as when we get up at work and we do a formal presentation or a status of our project, or um, we go to the CEO to present a project to them uh, versus that impromptu presentations where we're asked to participate during a meeting, or we meet somebody in the hallway that's new, or we're you know, whatever it, the situation might be, those more impromptu situations, both those type of skills are different 
but we also teach them and they're very valuable. We teach organizational skills in terms of organizing those teams, getting ourselves organized, setting goals for ourselves, and actually working to achieve those and, and building paths to, to actually get there and happening. Our uh, club success plan is like a mini strategic planning exercise. It's uh, if we pull that up through the organization, we do that. We do a strategic plan at the district level. We do a strategic plan at the regional level. We do a strategic plan at the organizational level. And each of those levels, we're learning more complexities in strategic planning. We're saying, well, we're going to achieve this this year, but in the long term, in three years, how can we build a better foundation that would make this annual goal easier to reach or, or even better, higher performing over, over time? And so we learn strategic planning at, at some level in the club. We, again, at, at a somewhat of a, a level, re, depending on if you're talking in the program or if it's funded or if you're in a in a club that you fund your own activities, you've got some budgeting going on. So when you look at things that you may have as a plan for your club, you've got it or your program, you've also got to look at the financial implications. Um, feedback skills, I've talked about that earlier, but the importance of that when you've got subject matter experts in the workplace, but they don't want to be promoted to supervisor because then they're going to have to deal with those dreaded things called people and employees because they don't want to give them feedback. They don't want to have to tell them bad news or hold them accountable. And yet in Toastmasters, it's just a second nature. It's a skill that we learn and we use it everywhere. And I know that how many times in the workplace I was called in to coach supervisors on how to give feedback to their employees because they were afraid. They didn't know how to say it tactfully. They, they thought it would be taken the wrong way. They didn't have the words to say it. And yet, really, in Toastmasters, we do it every week. And we learn how to be better at it because somebody says, well, that was, well, we've all heard, that was a whitewash. <laughs> and that's what we want to do in the workplace sometimes. We go, oh, yeah, everything's good. Go away. <laughs> Just go back to your office, do your work. But what do we to say when we have to say, you know, here's part of your work that you excel at. What we really need to focus on is what are we going to do in this section? This is your developmental section. Let's talk about how this can improve. And we engage them in not just telling them how to make it better, but asking them how it can be better. So those questions, questioning skills, but also those feedback skills and those good listening skills to actually hear what they're telling us, not just running our agenda, but hearing what they're telling us. Meeting management. Now, this is obvious, but we often forget that this is a skill. Think of the meetings, the hundreds of meetings that you've sat through and when, when is this over? I thought this was a half hour meeting. And somebody's up there and you go, please let the floor cave in and get me out of here. So we learn to speak within time, which is a great gift to all those around us. And we learn to manage meetings. And guess what? We often get asked to organize them because we know how to organize them. When I was the second last corporation I worked at, we started a grassroots uh, movement and we, we did training for all the support staff, uh, whether they were administrators or secretaries or clerks, whatever they were. We started a grassroots level with them that because they were the people that built the agendas for the meeting and we got them to put time limits on the agenda. We almost had a revolution in our organization not by the staff that was reporting out because we thought that was great because we could make a clear, concise report and move on. But the VPs or the CEOs that wanted to talk didn't like being given 10 minutes. 
They wanted to talk as long as they wanted. They didn't realize that everybody quit listening already, <laughs> but they just wanted. So it was really an interesting exercise that we got people to actually consider that when they asked for eight minutes or 10 minutes, they would be given 10 minutes and then the chair would move on to the next item. And we actually changed the culture by doing that. But just assigning what we do in Toastmasters all the time. Do you want five minutes? Do you want 10 minutes? Do you need 15 minutes? Are we going to have an exercise with this? Is there participation? Let's change it accordingly. And so teaching. So we, as Toastmasters, can influence and teach meeting management to the people around us. Interpersonal skills. This is something that I certainly learned in Toastmasters was how to talk to somebody that I'd never seen before. Didn't know if I had anything in common with, but how to do that, to have the confidence. And that's the other thing that we get is that confidence. It's invisible until it shows up. And then there's no denying that it's there. It's that um, we used to say in the training world when we were hiring people as trainers that they had it. And we would say, what is it? And it's almost indefinable, but it's like the person that walks out on the stage and you go, ah, oh, I can relax. I know they've got this. Or the person that walks into the room and you think, yeah, this is going to be okay. They know what they're doing before they even open their mouth, but they've got it. They've got the confidence. They've got the presence from doing this and being in front of people. And it it is super valuable in the workplace from my experience. I hired people because they had it. There was no room on the hiring sheet for it, but it measured a lot. So we, we give that confidence and help people build it. We learn uh, some public relations and promotion. We learn to ask difficult questions. I found that my writing skills increased dramatically as a result of becoming a better speaker because I learned to edit better. So writing skills improved. I realized that I needed an opening body conclusion to each paragraph, each thought that I had just as I did in my speech. And I learned to take out the superfluous stuff and organize it better. So my writing skills increased. And then mentoring, which we often don't talk about in the workplace, but happens all the time, formally and informally. We mentor people. New people come to work for us. They say, oh, Harold will show you the ropes. Well, that's immediately a mentoring relationship. Or Adam will help you out with that. Ask Adam if you need help. They're setting up a mentoring relationship to some extent. At, at how I would define mentoring is like you're apprenticing with me for a period of time. It could be a day. It could be a week. It could be a year. Uh, it could be many years. But formal and informal mentoring is something that we're very comfortable with. And then the whole emotional intelligence that's never spoken in our curriculum, but that we do a lot in emotional development, emotional um, intelligence development. Just think of how we listen to people and we have compassion for their stories. We overcome their obstacles or their challenges in Toastmasters. This is where people come, whether it's to develop stronger speaking skills, whether it's to overcome a, a speech impediment, whether it's to overcome that social awkwardness. We have empathy, we have time, we support them, or whatever it is, people come with their needs uh, to Toastmasters. And so we build that supportive uh, environment, which is really about emotional intelligence. So really a lot of transferable skills that just add value to the program if we translate it into that. So I want to switch uh, pace now for a moment and uh, talk about things that we require, and this will harken back to things we talked about earlier, 
things that we require from the HR, the training department of the corporation. And I like to have this, this a conversation with them probably about the second, depends on how it goes, but about the second conversation I have with them uh, about how we're going to work together going forward. So I give them that broad overview to begin with that we talked about in the beginning, but then this is kind of the second phase is communication to their staff. So how do they intend to communicate the Toastmasters program out to their staff? And what I know in all my years is that I, if I'm selling, if I'm selling chocolate cake, I do not leave it to somebody who has never eaten, never tasted, never baked a chocolate cake to sell the benefits of my chocolate cake. I'm the one that has to give the unique uh, approach to my chocolate cake. So in other words, do not expect HR to know how to advertise Toastmasters. We need to give them that. They don't know the transferable skills that we just talked about. They don't know the, um, the special skills and knowledge. They don't know how it works. They don't know why, why people would want to join. They probably don't even know anybody that's experienced it. We can't expect them. We need to support them with words, stories, anecdotes, so that they can promote the, the Toastmaster program. And there's lots of material to do that. We need to suggest that if they have orientation for new employees, that the Toastmaster program could be part of that new orientation for employees. It's a great exposure. They could do something verbal or have uh, one of the Toastmaster members or, or participants come and present, or they could actually uh, just put material in the new hire package saying, this is a benefit we offer our employees on site. If you want, if you're interested, come see our HR department. So there's a number of ways that we can put it in front of people right away by working with the corporation. Make sure that it's put in the training catalog or the training calendar, if that's how it is. Put it on the intranet to make sure that it looks like the other training, that it looks like the safety training, that it looks like the project management training. It's a training program. And look at how do they actually provide material to the supervisors and managers so that they know why they would send their employees? Like if I'm an employee and I go to my supervisor and I say, I want to go to Toastmasters and they go, well, let me see what we have to do. What's that all about? Can I support that? And they can't find information. So we have to help the corporation figure out how they get that information or at least ask them how they're giving that information to their supervisors and managers. Which brings me to a just a side sidestep here for a moment. When I go to do an information session for a corporation, some people call it demo meeting, but I do it as an information session. I ask the corporation, who are they inviting to their information session? Why is that important? I want to know whether they're inviting their thousand employees or are they bringing all their supervisors and managers to find out about it? And I have a bias. My preference, if they say, well, we could do either one, which you would you want? I say, I want your supervisors and managers because they're the people that are going to stand between the employees and the Toastmasters learning program. They're going, no, nope, you can't have that much time. No, we're not paying for that for you. No, you're not doing a good enough. You're not a good enough communicator in your job. Why would I send you to a communication course? So I want supervisor managers to experience the Toastmasters program. And in the demo or in the information meeting, or some call it demo meeting, but information meeting, I actually get them to do table topics. I actually get them to do the evaluation of the speaker that I bring in. So they do the Toastmaster program so they understand what it feels like. So 
I, I try to do everything I can to inform uh, the organization of how this is going to work. And if I can get to the supervisors and managers to have them say, wow, because, you know, as human beings, we often go, oh, that'd be great for Alexandra, but I don't need it. <laughs> right? We're so quick to diagnose someone else, but not necessarily ourselves. So we, um, so we'll let the supervisors and managers know. The other thing that is important from the HR department is if they have those checklists or they have those um, accountabilities already built in, and we want to link into that. I've talked a bit about that. Also, a letter of agreement um, that would happen between the supervisors and the participants so that they know that they're being held accountable, like I said, at 80% attendance, how much participation, how many presentations, how many roles within the meeting. And that's something that Toastmasters needs to help those people with because they don't know. They don't know that there's formal presentations and roles in the meeting. But what our purpose is, is to get people to engaged and working the program and holding them accountable to do that. And that's why we're doing it that way. And the other thing that I ask the corporation, just as a curiosity, is do they have recognition within their corporation? And what do they recognize? And how do they recognize it? So if they have, say, a monthly or uh, biweekly publication on their, web, on their uh, intranet about so-and-so completed a project within time and below budget, or so-and-so completed their master's certificate, or so and so, I want them to be aware that we're going to have Toastmasters designations on there. There's going to be people completing levels in this ongoing communication program, and we would like recognition for them. What if somebody in that corporate program became an area director? We want that splashed. We want some publicity for them, some recognition to say, this person has stepped up and beyond to the next level of leadership in an international global organization. Not the Toastmaster Club in the, in, the, in the corporation necessarily or the Toastmaster program, but they're involved now in the global organization or they're involved in the district and how many countries that involves, how many cities, how many people that encompasses. That's newsworthy. And so to think about that, be, be always looking for opportunities to promote success, builds confidence, builds self-esteem, and also builds reputation and exposure for the program. So things that the corporation can expect from Toastmasters International, and this comes back to the district and to the area directors and to Toastmasters International. First of all, we assign sponsors and mentors to a brand new club. One of the things that I'm really uh, very aware of is that I want my sponsors and mentors trained in knowing how to do this correctly and that they're setting it up correctly so that it's least likely to fail. So we need to train our sponsors and mentors. I want also more than a six month commitment. That's my own personal, but we have a lot of cycles in Toastmasters and their annual cycles. And so I like to see mentors in particular stay at least a year. And then somebody even step in after that to support them. Because remember, if you've got changing people in a corporation, you don't always have a solid core base passing on and leading. So I Toastmasters has to be involved in an org, as an organization a bit more, in my opinion. And then we also want to um, look at the agenda. Don't take an agenda that works for a community club and just slip it over and put it in the corporate club. Make sure that each agenda item on that for that corporate program makes sense. We don't need a bunch of, um, well, let me put it this way. I believe that every corporate program needs an education component. Uh, depending on the, the corporation that you're going into, 
they may need the grammarian to be a longer lesson than two or three minutes. So the corporation I talked to yesterday has majority of ESL, English as a second language, or their third or fourth language, a lot of immigrant employees. And so they need and want a larger grammarian session. So expand it to meet your client's needs. If language, regardless of what is your first language, doesn't have to be English, but whatever language you're meeting in, adapt that to meet the needs. So have an education component, consider your gram grammar role in that meeting if you need it. And then from there, look at having within two out, within an hour, you can have two prepared speeches, the evaluations, have a grammarian, um, a grammarian report, have um, a general evaluation of how did the evaluators do? How did the meeting run overall? And have an evaluation of your table topics so that people, even when they do table topics, are getting evaluated. Now, all my career in Toastmasters, I've always belonged to clubs that evaluated Toastmasters and or evaluated table topics. And only in the last couple of years, I learned that not all clubs or programs evaluate table topics, but it's a great way to practice evaluation and to get feedback when you're not doing a prepared speech. So those things are really important to look at. Uh, we need to also make sure that our sponsors and mentors are um, bringing that international perspective to that club so that they understand that they're part of a global organization, um, the preparation for goals for the year, and all of the information that's required for onboarding new members, how they register, how they are even new participants, who's doing what, and how they get on board to somebody looking after to make sure that they get um, enrolled in pathways, what that looks like when they get into the curriculum, who's helping them get ready for their icebreaker, all of that stuff that we want to set up in any club that we create. And then looking around and saying, are we looking after our members? Because every six months, they're going to decide, well, every week, actually, they decide, but really consider it every six months if they're coming back again. And they're going to look at, what did I learn in the last six months? Is this worth my time? Or am I going to go and take that other training over there? Because we, I don't know, but I've always got a list of things that I'm going to do. And so I go, okay, does Toastmaster still at the top of the list? Yep, okay. Uh, but sometimes maybe not. And I know in the, I mean, I, I know I'm the exception. I 39 years in Toastmasters, but for me, I, every year I found something new to work on. Uh, some years I was totally bored giving speeches. I could hardly stand to listen to another speech contest. I wouldn't go to a speech contest, but I found then I really needed to work on my evaluation because that was really demanding at work. Or I needed to really, um, I really needed to work on giving tough messages. And so I would practice in my environment of, of how do I give tough feedback? And I go to sessions about that. I learned in certainly in Toastmasters that I had to have the skills of resolving conflict. And I didn't learn that in Toast. I, I mean, I became aware of that in Toastmasters, but I then went and took a two year certificate program on dealing with conflict because I was so conflict adverse. And I brought it back to Toastmasters and I practiced it in my club before I took it to my workplace because I was super clumsy with it. But my Toastmaster club helped me. So I morphed my practicing laboratory into what I needed it to be in my continuous lifelong learning. And uh, just as I've taken many courses and wanted to try the material out I would bring it to my Toastmasters club in, in the terms of a seven minute presentation and they'd go, oh, that was interesting, tell us more, or that was enough of that. And uh, so I, I used them for all kinds of ways of learning and continuing to learn, yeah. 
So I'm going to stop talking. I think I've covered most of the content that I wanted to cover, and we're going to look at, at questions that we have because I um, want to make sure we've answered your questions also. So, um, oh, Oralee, some questions I hope can be answered tonight. How do we how do we recover a bad start? Is that still a question? Uh, yes, when I read your book and you started as well with that, we should start uh, as we want to go along. Yes. But, uh, you know, we are doing this uh, course training now. We have started some in Airbus, some clubs who in some other countries have started much before us in Germany. Yes. And there were several mistakes. On, like I told you yesterday, there was this question about member and guests. I don't think we have answered that, but especially Simon, I thought he was a good answer. He was answering the question. But anyway, you know, I'm wondering how we got from our mistakes to recover the situation. Yeah, I, I love it. Thank you, Orly. I love that question. It's a tough question. Uh, it's really knowing your culture. But what I would do is that it's really hard to work backwards. So we can only work forwards and, and and moving forward. So what I would do is suggest to the people that you're working with now in building a new way, just say that, you know, over time, we've learned that to build more successful Toastmaster clubs or programs with more robustness and better sustainability, that we do things a bit differently. And so I'd like to propose that we look at building this next learning program that a different way and see if they're open to that. And then, then the onus is on the new program to show that, ah, that works better. And then you can convert them backwards. But I think you have to build forward in a different way, build it robustly, show that it works and what kind of results you get and then um, have them change it backwards if they want to actually change it. Does that make sense? <laughs> we'll try, we'll try our best with that. <laughs> Maybe another question, if I may. Um, you were saying uh, if you don't feel confident enough or good to uh, sell, or to speak yes. about budget, etc. You should not be the one speaking. And when I read your book, you say we also need to adapt Toastmaster to the needs of the company. Yep. Uh, by Airbus, I believe we are several, uh, several, I don't know how much you, I won't say the number, but we are several which know both Toastmasters and we are employees. So I believe this group of people, we, we know quite well how Toastmaster can be adapted to uh, Airbus world. But for example, we had a meeting shortly with, uh, uh, I think it was yesterday with our sponsor, and he asked us what is the minimum of uh, people that needs to be part of a club. I didn't know your answer of 25 to 35. We were three answering 20, one answering four, one answering five, one answering eight. I think we gave a pretty bad impression that we knew what we were speaking about. Yes, I would agree. Uh, you can't charter without a minimum of 20. 20 are required to actually form a, a, form a, a club or a program. But, but I do anything in minimums. And if we, you know, um, surely that when we say, well, we have to have a minimum of 20 at all times, if we start at 20, we'll almost always lose somebody in the next few weeks. So now we're below the minimum. And I don't know about you, but I don't like minimums of anything in my life. I don't like one pair of shoes, which would be the minimum I need, or one dress, that's the minimum I need, or uh, $50 in my bank account, because that's the minimum I can live with. We don't do minimums in our lives. We want more. Uh, same in the, in the Toastmaster program. We need some, some uh, balance. We need some uh, leverage or some um, cushion mm -hmm. so that we're not right at 
the line of being out of minimum. So that's why I always say 25 to 35. Mm -hmm. because I don't want them to aim for minimum because then they're always going oh their mindset suddenly is oh we need 20 and then they go well 18 isn't bad well 18 actually is out of integrity with the program my, so my, my question would be how to adapt this to knowledge the knowledge of the Airbus employee knowing Toastmaster and knowing quite well how we can adapt Toastmaster worlds to Airbus world and the knowledge you were speaking about being able to sell those masters correctly and answer the question correctly. That's where I'm, I think we have also some difficulties with. Yeah. Um, well, I'm at a disadvantage, I think, because I don't understand Airbus. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I would look at, um, yeah, I, I would, I would just ask them lots of questions if I'm and and then translate it in my in my head like what how does that relate to Toastmasters and I'm not sure I'm understanding your question totally so I'm having difficulty answering it yeah okay so you're asking about how to adapt it to to Airbus yeah, when I, if I understood correctly, in your book, you were saying we should not try to uh, come with the community club, the Toastmaster, and impose it to the company. That's right. We should, we should try to listen to the company's needs and yeah. adapt Toastmaster work to the company needs. Yes. Working, being a several uh, employee of Toastmaster, working in Airbus, so knowing what the company needs and mm -hmm. knowing Toastmaster, we can, uh, this group of people can pretty good uh, advise and yes. having maybe the right proposal. But as you see, <laughs> we, are, we may not be that good <laughs> to answer correctly the questions. And that, that's where I think we have some difficulties as well. Okay, uh, that's great, Orly. Thank you for explaining that in different words so I could understand. What I would really suggest that you do in, in those kind of situations is to invite some of your district officers. So for example, Kushi, who is your club growth director, who knows the minimum requirements, knows what Toastmasters requires to make sure that she or Katarina, who was, I'm assuming, uh, club growth last year, would be very familiar with those and would be glad to help you to make sure that you've got the correct information because talking about four or eight or uh, people in the program is really confusing for Airbus, I'm sure. And, and understanding how many you actually need to get started. Um, you know, so just basic stuff like that, they, would, they also understand the application process that we have to send in to get approval to actually start meeting, all, all of that, that they would be able to support you in that. So rely on your district team, they're, that's, that's what they're there for and they'll gladly help you, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Great. Thanks for your questions. That was great. Uh, Saravana said, how do we identify interested colleagues? I'm working with only two other people in my corporation now, but I find it would be better to have more colleagues working together before chartering a club. Oh, um, you know what, Saravana, this is a, this is a, a challenging question. How do we find um, how do we find other people? Um, I, I guess I have a bias, <laughs> so I'll just be upfront about it. I'm going to be transparent. I have a bias. Two is great. Ten is too many. Four can be maybe all right if you all think alike. But Saravana, I think that if you get a district member to go with you, that makes three. They'll have the knowledge. I think you're best set not to take a not to take a crowd because you're actually promoting it to the corporation and you're not going to run it they are so i would say it's ideal if you've got two if you've got two other people with you that's three and you take kushi or katrina with you i think it's perfect 
So don't go looking for any more. Let the corporation find the people that want to come to the training, but go and enroll the corporation in your concept. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Start thinking of who you can talk to in the corporation. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Simon. I would like to come back to a statement that you, you made early on. You said that um, it's up to the company to find the people to come to the training. And I think I don't see how to to, to reconcile that with the concept, the basic concept of Toastmasters, which is a, a volunteer uh, approach that I want to, to get better, I want to train and then I go. Uh, you know, as opposed to the company sending uh, people to the training. So, and, and also it's, um, uh, it's a, a lifelong experience. So if the company is sending people, then will they send them for a week? Do they send off for, for two weeks or for a month? Or, and um, will, that, will that be uh, very hard logistic for the company to handle? Because then they will have to handpick people and then send them to the program for which time frame and then you know, change them to another people. Yeah. So is that feasible from a workload point of view for a company? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for those questions. Yes, it's totally feasible for both of those questions are resounding. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, first of all, people all the time in the workplace go to their employer or their supervisor and say, I see there's a program on the, in the training calendar that I'd like to go to. Can I, may I go? They ask permission. On the other hand, their employer will come to them or their supervisor comes to them and said, you know, remember when we did your review and we were talking about you building confidence of lead, um, leading meetings? Uh, there's a Toastmasters program. Would you consider going to it? So that back and forth like that happens all the time. So just don't don't wear your Toastmasters hat. Wear your corporate hat because they're very different. So we ask at our workplace for training all the time and our supervisor and, and if it's offered they'll say yes in some cases they'll send us to university or a college course because they want us to get special training because we ask or we put that in our plan and it of course varies from corporation to corporation and their internal policies so you have to know the internal policies the other part of uh, getting people to come and and how long they'll stay we have a wide range, but I'll give you an example in Canada because I'm very familiar with it, is the capital regional, not the capital regional district, the, uh, the Canada Revenue Agency, which is a federal government agency that looks after our money, looks after our taxes and our, our income tax, et cetera. And they're across our country in all big cities. They have Toastmaster clubs, but they have built a policy they have an internal policy, which I suggest all corporations develop as their own policy. And within that policy, it specifies that they will support and pay the tuition of their employees up to two years to be in Toastmasters. And after that, they basically say, you don't have to quit the club, but we're not paying for you anymore. You either see the benefit and want to continue on your own, or you've got what you came for and you can leave, but we'll pay up to two years. And so I think that that's a fairly fair and equitable um, policy. They've decided that's their commitment to their, or to their corporation across the country. Anybody that wants to go to Toastmasters in their corporate programs. Yeah. So um, corporations, um, you know, we, I had this um, program, I had an agreement with my employees when I worked in the corporation that, that I would send them and every six months we would review what they had done and that I would support them again in terms of time and, and tuition if they were meeting their goals. And when they lost interest, they lost interest. They went on to something else. So I think it's important to look at what the policies already are in place in the corporation because they have policies for training. Um, know what those are or know what, ask them about them and just say, we can use the same ones for Toastmasters. But because it's experiential and we're asking people to go every week for an hour, 
Um, some corporations have how many training hours an employee can go to during a year. So then you have to work with that. They have a, we'll give uh, $500, up to $500 for, for every employee that has this position every year for training. So they do it all different ways in my experience, but I don't know how they do it in, in your geographical area, but, but talk to them and they'll tell you how they do it. And then you can figure out how it'll work because you'll need X amount of dollars for renewals. Um, we really want an employee to be two years in Toastmasters to start and show some, you know, solid um, progress. And I'm on red, and I just want to finish with a very short story uh, about the power of the Toastmasters program. Um, a few years ago within my home club, and I belong to a community club, uh, we, we had this young man who was quite outstanding. He was a scientist, but he had personality. He had innovative, creative ideas. He was, just, he was just a delightful person to be around. And he came for communication skills. And he was in our club, and he was very engaged, and he participated. He did a fair number of presentations. He was always on the agenda. He, was, he served on the executive. And one day when he came to our meeting and we meet at seven in the morning, he walked in and he walked in with a, a middle-aged woman. And I thought, oh, I wonder if this is his mother or his aunt or his older sister or what this is. So I went over to introduce myself and he said, um, she said, oh, I'm Brady's supervisor at work. I said, oh, nice to meet you. Fantastic. What brought you here? She said, I've watched the growth of Brady over the past two years, and I've got to see what has been changing him so much. And she joined Toastmasters with her employee because she saw it happening right in front of her. And although he brought so much already, she saw it magnified and those different transferable skills show up with him that it was noticeable in the workplace. So I know every day that we bring a great transferable skill set to the workplace and to, for us to get it situated in a place that they can access it, that they can own it and support it so that we can be successful. We just bring, just remember, we just bring that little package online. We bring the curriculum. We bring the sponsors and mentors to support, to get them started and to keep it going so that they understand this strange culture that we bring into their organization. All we need to do is get them enrolled in the program. And the program will deliver the benefits without a doubt. If you work the program, the program will work for you. So I wish you the very best. I'm so honored to have had all this time with you. Thank you for showing up, uh, staying. And thank you to Kushi and Katarina for inviting me. It was my honor to uh, visit again to District 95, which is um, part of a region that's very close and special to my heart. And uh, so I wish you all the very best. And Sarah Vanna, we want, we'll be tracking you in that new club. <laughs> and certainly Airbus will be seeing how that transpires as well. So thank you so much. And over to you, Kushi. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. We are definitely interested in forming strong clubs, not a lot of clubs. So I'd like that idea of the 25 to 35 is our baseline um, because that means strength within a club. I'm gonna hand over to Katarina who will close the session with some a few more remarks. But before we close the session, Kushi, I think we have one more thing to do because we have our special guest, Olga, whom we should not forget because she has a short announcement to make. Olga, the stage is yours. Thank you, Katerina. Yes, very short announcement, but very interesting and energetic. Um, as you probably know, in District 95, we are launching a new project, which is called Toastmasters Video Library for Corporate, corporate Programs. What does it mean and who 
will be the client for this future library. The future library will not be looking like that behind me. It will be all online available for every corporate club, new and existing, to support, to help engage into the probe in the Toastmasters program and to support existing club in the questions where they might be still interested. I know Toastmasters world is enormous, that's, and we are only starting this library. So this year, there will be only four direction of the new videos that we will present in this library. And that will be about meeting roles, what are they about, offices roles, Toastmasters world, how to use it, and Toastmasters platform and platforms, electronic platforms, and how to use them. In this library, there will be short videos explaining different topics of Toastmasters world, of Toastmasters roles, of Toastmasters um, questions, topics, items. Very famous and very professional Toastmasters will produce these videos and make them available for you. The information will be delivered in a very short, succinct and very clear way, in very Toastmasters way, and it will explain you everything what you might be interested about Toastmasters platform. Please follow our project and I hope that will be will bring success to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Olga. We are very much looking forward to this video and hopefully all of our corporate programs will use them. For now, we have finished our leadership trainings though and because that was the fourth out of four sessions. And I'm really happy to see if I'm not mistaken, all of you have been to a session before so that you actually receive your credit for participating in this training. And there is one person that I want to specifically highlight because this person was at all four trainings. And yes, that's not Hushi because she was also at all four trainings, but I want to mention a participant and that's Monica, congratulations, it's really great that you took the time and effort to not only join the two required sessions, but all four of them. So thank you very much, Monica. It was a pleasure and it was very interesting, the all four sessions. Glad to hear. So final announcement before I let you go into your well-deserved evening. I took notes of all attendance over all of the sessions. Well, for session three, Hushi was, uh, was so friendly to provide me a screenshot because I couldn't be there. But I will enter the attendance within the next week. So please check whether you are correctly entered in the system. So in case there went something wrong, we can still correct it. And please also look at the attendance for all of your programs. So in case somebody from your program still needs to attend sessions. You can have a look at the list of all COTs that we're hosting for the community clubs as well, and feel free to join those sessions in case you still need it. With that, I close this session officially, and I don't know about you, Pat, whether you might want to stay for more questions if there are any, otherwise feel free to stay and chat with or without pet. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to have to excuse myself because I've got another commitment, but thank you so much um, for having me and asking me. I feel honored. So good it luck. It was really great to have you, Pat. Thank you so much. I have so one much. last question for you, oh. Pat. You've got a very interesting background. Is this a hobby or a business or just you love beautiful things. <laughs> I I have a collection of backgrounds, so I I can give you whatever you want. Um, <laughs> depending on the mood. 
I hope to see Nashville up there at some point. Well, I'll take some pictures when I'm in Nashville so I can use them for background. Are you going to be there? Yes, of course you are. Katarina and I will both be there, yes. Yeah, good. I look forward to meeting you. I'm going to be there also. So it'll be great that to meet in person. Like that. Yes, yeah, absolutely. So best wishes to everybody and I'll